Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everyone who's joining us on uh, Zoom. And good morning to everybody who's here with us live at St. Joseph's Healthcare Hamilton this morning. Uh, we'll, we'll get started in preparation for uh, Dr. Mitri's talk. And for those who aren't at St. Joe's, uh, welcome. And I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that St. Joseph Healthcare Hamilton sits on the traditional territories of the Mississaugas and the Haudenosaunee nations and within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. This is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace friendship and respect. So again, I'd like to welcome you all today and I would like to introduce our speaker. Our speaker is Dr. Mino Mitri, who is an internist and a palliative medicine specialist. After graduating from McGill University's medical school, Dr. Mino Mitri trained in internal medicine at Queen's University. Fueled by a passion for education and palliative care, he pursued just making sure that I'm unmuted here. <laughs> he, he pursued a Master of Education while at Queen's University through the Clinician Investigator Program. In 2019, he was the first to graduate at the University of British Columbia from the inaugural Royal College subspecialty of palliative medicine. He is now a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Medicine and the program director for the new program McMaster University's Royal College subspecialty of palliative medicine. His clinical and academic interests include palliative care in non-malignant diseases, sexual medicine, palliative medicine education, and improving the art of medical presentations. And I can say I speak for everybody at St. Joe's that it's been a delight to have Dr. Mitri join us earlier this year uh, and join the powerhouse palliative medicine team alongside Dr. Ann Woods uh, and Dr. Ann Boyle. So, uh, with no further ado, Dr. Mitri, we'll invite you up to give us your talk entitled Bringing Dignity to Medical Education, a question we should be asking all learners. Thanks, Mino. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rahasik, for that introduction. If you don't mind, I'm just going to take this off so I can speak more clearly. Um, I wanted to also just um, thank everybody for welcoming me at, uh, at the St. Joe's family. It's been honestly a great um, privilege to be part of this great community. Um, and uh, I'm, I want to express my gratitude that you've carved out some of your morning time to be here for this presentation. Uh, just a bit of a heads up about the presentation. So it's divided into two parts. Each part is going to be about 15 to 20 minutes. And right in the middle of the presentation, there'll be what I call a one minute cyber break. We all have very busy lives. It'll give you that chance to send that text message, connect quickly, send that uh, brief little email uh, for that one minute in the middle, and then we'll continue with the rest of the presentation. There'll be sufficient time at the end to ask any questions uh, and to um, hear some of your comments and feedback, which I would be very interested to hear. Uh, for those who are attending virtually and cannot see the slides, don't worry about it. You can just listen to me and uh, uh, you should be able to follow the presentation. Uh, for er everybody else, I invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy the presentation. Oh, it's Dr. Boyle. <laughs> I was waiting for Dr. Boyle to come in. <laughs> okay. How well do we know our learners? Not so much their favorite food or whether or not they're Maple Leafs fan, but rather, how well do we know them as learners? Are they a visual, auditory, or kinesthetic learner? How comfortable are they in the hospital environment? How do they assimilate information? What kind of teachers work best with them? What sort of career are they envisioning for themselves? Have they ever faced failure? And if so, what is their response to failure? 
What if we knew the answers to all those questions? Could we then better tailor our teaching and supervising methods? There are so many questions to be asked, but all can be encapsulated into one question. What do I need to know about you as a learner to give you the best educational experience possible? I have no conflict of interest, but I have an interest to convince you that this question is worth asking at the start of any student preceptor relationship. But first, what is the story behind this question? I mean, where did this question even come from? During my palliative medicine training, I learned about all sorts of communication tools. I've always said that proficient communication skills are the most powerful tools you can carry at the patient's bedside. They are like stethoscopes that al allow us to listen more deeply to the thoughts behind the actions. They are like scalpels cutting through a shell of emotions, bringing to surface our patients and their families' vulnerability. Proficient communication skills set a stage for patients and families to be seen and allow us healthcare providers to see them in return. So whenever I go see a patient, I strap on my communication tool belt and depending on what I see, who's in front of me, what's going on, what are the circumstances, what questions are being asked, what questions do I need to ask, I'll select from a set of tools, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. One such tool is the patient dignity question. And what the patient dignity question asks is what do I need to know about you as a person to give you the best care possible? This question was created and coined by Dr. Harvey Chachna, a psychiatrist and palliative care physician at the University of Manitoba. He has studied and published extensively on psychosocial issues in advanced illness, creating new forms of psychotherapy and furthering our understanding about the impact of illness on a patient's life. With the patient dignity question specifically, he sought to bring personhood to the clinical radar because failure to recognize personhood is often the root cause of patient and family dissatisfaction within medical care. So recognizing this, he researched the impact of the patient dignity question on patients, families, and healthcare professionals. Between September of 2011 and April 2013, a group of researchers in Manitoba recruited 126 participants. That is a combination of both patients and families. If patients couldn't speak for themselves, they would assign a family member to speak on their behalf. Then a nurse who participated in the research project would go around to the patients and or family member and ask them the patient dignity question. What do I need to know about you to give you the best care? What do I need to know about you as a person to give you the best care possible? They would listen to their answer, summarize it into a brief one to two paragraph, bring it back to the patient, read it, to check for accuracy and with their consent, put in the chart for all healthcare professionals to see. These patients were receiving inpatient care at one of the three uh, palliative care facilities affiliated with the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority. Who are these patients? Their demographics look a little, like, a little bit like this. About half were male, half were female. Most had a university or college education. And as is expected for most patients in palliative care facilities, most had a diagnosis of cancer. Now, how did the patient dignity question impact patients or their families? Well, quite positively overall, of the 126 participants, what was most interesting is that 85% felt that the information collected was important for healthcare professionals to know. So, how did the healthcare professionals respond? What the healthcare professionals did is that when they went to the patient's chart and saw an answer to the patient dignity question, they would read it and answer a survey question, see what is their response to it. And they would answer questions like, did you learn something new about the patient from the patient dignity question? 
Were you emotionally affected by it? Did it influence your attitude towards the patient? Did it influence your care towards the patient? Your respect? Maybe your empathy towards the patient? Did it affect your connectedness? And finally, did it affect your satisfaction with the care you're delivering to the patient? There were 137 healthcare professionals who were recruited. And these were a multitude of different type of professionals. We're talking about physicians, medical residents, medical students, nurses, nursing students, social workers, healthcare aides, uh, chaplains as well. And as would be expected, for every patient response, multiple healthcare professionals would answer the survey questions. So therefore, there are 293 evaluations completed. So how did the healthcare professionals respond? Well, about 50% said that it influenced their attitude, care, respect, or empathy towards the patient. In addition, 63% felt that it affected their connectedness. Now we need to keep in mind that these are healthcare professionals working in a palliative care environment, that they are already equipped with their own tool belt, with many different communication tools that they use to allow them to have increased empathy, care, and respect for patients. So if this was done in a different environment, we may have different responses. But what was most interesting that despite the fact that they work in a palliative care environment, 90% of them said they learned something new about the patient. And the authors argued that this in of itself made the intervention worthwhile. Because at the end of the day, knowledge is power. Once you know something, you can't unknow it. And once you know it, it may subconsciously affect the way that you provide care to the patients. And I can speak about that from personal experience. Whenever I see patients now, whenever in either in my hat as a palliative care physician or as a general internist, I do ask the patient dignity question. What do I need to know about you as a person to give you the best care possible? And I've learned so many new things about patients. I recall one woman tell me that she's a, a very private person, very shy and timid naturally, kind of keeps to herself. That being in the hospital environment is very exposing, being probed and poked, disrobed, sent to all sorts of investigations and, and treatments. Mind you, she, she consented to all these interventions because it was a means to an end that she wanted to achieve. But nonetheless, it put her outside of her comfort zone. Or I recall another patient who would tell me, you know, I'm a straight shooter. Tell me like it is. So I know that with this patient, although I'm honest with all my patients, I can be more intentionally honest and not worry so much on how the information would be received. Other responses relate to how patients want to be seen. Some would tell me that this is not who I am. Who you see in this bed is not who I am. All this does is at the end of the day, it just changes just a little bit my approach to patients. I mean, I did say that proficient communication skills set a stage for patients and families to be seen and allow us healthcare providers to see them in return. So can I also use such skills to allow learners to be seen? and for me, a preceptor to see them in return. Can I learn something new about learners as learners? And if so, would it change the way I teach? So in 2019, after completing my palliative medicine fellowship, I started asking learners this question. What do I need to know about you as a learner to give you the best educational experience possible? In the past two years of asking this question, I've collected a wide spectrum of answers. Answers like, I'm open to feedback, especially on the spot. I want targeted feedback, particularly about approaches to problems and presentations. Another said to me, I need time to assimilate information and time to organize my thoughts. Another learner shared, I ask a lot of questions. I prefer interactive teaching and teaching around cases. I like to be given new articles to read around cases. I'm a doer and a visual learner. I like to observe staff handling difficult conversations and I also want to be observed. 
I prefer to look up information on my own rather than lecture style of learning. I like to take a lot of notes. I will walk around on my notepad and take notes every time there's teaching. And I kid you not, she walked around with her notepad feverishly taking notes anytime there was teaching. In fact, I even comically would point out to her, I'm about to give you teaching, take out your notepad. <laughs> One learner said, I like to be given homework. It motivates me to read and learn. Only one learner in the past two years have told me they want to be given homework. No other learner have ever told me that they want to be given homework. But this one wanted homework. I feel more comfortable to learn in a supportive environment when there's camaraderie. I need repetition to learn. I am intimidated by the CTU environment. It scares me and many, many more answers. But what was the most common answer I received since asking this question for the last two years? You'll know after this one minute cyber break. So check your messages and I need to drink some water. <laughs> no one's messaging me, that's good. <laughs> Okay, so the beginning of the presentation, I said to you that I'd like to convince you that as to ask the question, what do I need to know about you as a learner to give you the best educational experience possible at the beginning of any student preceptor relationship. And in my personal experience in asking this question for the past two years, I've collected all sorts of answers. But what was the most common answer that I received? I don't know. And this is despite probing, I may get a one line answer, but what this highlights or possibly highlights is a skill that we may be under evaluating in medical education. And that's a skill of self-awareness. You know, we, we often do evaluate our learners, whether or you not know, they, their limitations in the clinical setting with patient care. You know, when do you know to ask for help? But self-awareness skills is more than that. It's knowing thyself, particularly in different environments. It's about avoiding comparison to other peers or wanting to be like other peers and rather truly knowing who one is in a particular learning environment. So when I get answers like, I don't know, it worries me that learners do not know who they actually are in the learning environment, how they learn, how they interact with their learning environment. And we know that high levels of self-awareness skills can protect individuals against the triple threat of burnout, compassion fatigue, and moral distress. Something that is more important now more than ever given our current climate. And when one of these threats is present, there's a sense of loss of meaning and control in life. And unfortunately, medical education doesn't naturally nurture a sense of self-awareness. Self in fact, it may sometimes involve a triggering event to prompt this awareness, an event like failure. Failing at anything in medicine is often perceived as a life-shattering event. It puts into question the automation of medical education, which arguably may not be such a bad thing. But how can learners nurture self-awareness without needing to go through an event like failure? There are actually four cardinal skills in developing greater self-awareness, and this is applicable to every aspect of our lives, not just in education. But I'm gonna draw a bit of parallel how this can apply in the world of medical education. And this is applicable to all of us. 
We are, after all, lifelong learners. The first is the ability to notice and observe sensations, thoughts, and feelings, even though they may be unpleasant. You know, an example is you're about to give a presentation and you're invited to stand up in front of an audience. You might feel your palms sweating, your throat is a bit dry, you're sweating in all sorts of places. All right. um, just being aware of that. When you're doing bedside teaching in a group and asking one of the learners to go up and do the JVP exam, and they're suddenly feeling a bit nauseous, their skin is tingling, they're feeling an excitement, nervousness, fear, what are they thinking? The first skill is just to be aware of them. The second is the ability to lower one's tendency to respond reactively to emotionally charged situations or experiences. So imagine you're running late and you're driving your car. I'm a Montreal driver. I drive like effectively. Uh, so if anybody cuts me through, oh boy, I'll say things that you'll never hear me say in person. And I might swerve and try to pass them. Fortunately, in the learning environment in hospitals, we don't often hear learners yelling or screaming down the hall and facing emotionally charged situations. I mean, it does happen, but very rarely. But the other reactive response that we may see is actually the shutdown and paralysis response. You know, example, a patient is crashing in front of you. I'll never forget my first year as a resident, first block, two weeks into my uh, uh, residency in internal medicine, cardiology. And we were normally four junior residents. I was the only one that day for a multitude of different reasons. And I was on call that day. No staff in sight running around taking care of all the patients. And sure enough, at that transfer hour of 5 p.m., one of the patient codes. And I was so overwhelmed from the entire day that all I can do in that moment is nothing. I just stood there. And I'll never forget my senior resident running around behind me, jumping on the patient and starting chest compressions and thinking, oh yeah, that's what I should be doing. <laughs> I shut down in that moment. And many learners have shared with me that they experienced something similar to that. You know, it's that overwhelming feeling. So instead of shutting down, the third ability is an enhanced ability to react with awareness and intention, rather than being on that reactive autopilot. You know, going back to that driving that car, acknowledging in that moment, okay, I'm going to be late. That's just going to happen. That's the reality. Put on the Bluetooth, call the person who's leading the meeting. I'm going to be late. Start be, uh, without me. There's a few things I want to just say ahead of time. Drive smoothly. You know, don't think of a million of the different excuses of why you're late. Just, you're late. It's okay. You know, rather than shutting down, acknowledging in that moment when you're seeing that patient crashing, the sensations, the feelings, the thoughts, and know in that moment, I'm uncomfortable. I need help. Not comparing ourselves to our other peers who say, you know, they did a better job or they're able to handle this. Why can't I handle this? You can't handle this in that moment. There are certain situations that are making you unable to handle that situation in that moment. You know, we think about studying for exams as well, the Royal College exams. You know, all of us buy that textbook because everybody bought the textbook. Some of us actually open the wrap and actually start reading that textbook. But in internal medicine, there are millions, there are thousands of resources out there. Are we actually doing it with intention to choose that resource and selecting the one that actually works for us to simulate information? Or are we just doing it because everybody else says that's the one, so I'll just do it, right? The fourth cardinal skill is focusing on the experience and not really on the labels or judgments we apply to them. The concept behind that is really that feeling an emotion rather than wondering, is it okay to feel that emotion? You know, before an interview, it's CARM's interview season. Many of you may feel nervous before that interview. And some may wonder, is it okay to be nervous? Or some say, don't be nervous. No, you are nervous. Just accept it. You're nervous. And, and just focus on the experience of what it's going to be like. You know, um, I had a learner who had to handle a difficult conversation with a patient navigating that um, conversation, sharing the prognosis, disclosing that options are getting limited for care. And the learner may feel nervous, may start to feel sad or cry and wonder, is it okay that I felt sad? Is it okay that I felt nervous? Why is it someone else wouldn't feel nervous in that situation? 
you felt that emotion. Let's not start judging that emotion. Let's just focus on the experience and see what we can learn from that. By developing a greater self-awareness, learners can better answer this question. What do I need to know about you as a learner to give you the best educational experience possible? And as a result of better answering this question, it may potentially change the way we teach. It certainly has changed the way I teach. It made me a lot more aware of the individual learning styles and needs of the learners. So as opposed to seeing them as a, a group of learners who should just be absorbing what I teach or say, I now see them as individual learners, each with their own unique identities. It's that idea of bringing personhood, or if you'd like, dignity, to medical education. So when I do my teaching, I might do more or less didactic teaching, assign readings or homework for those who request it. I might provide exercise sheets with visuals, graphs, or questions. In fact, I started something called rapid fire teaching in the early mornings of CTU for about 10, 15 minutes, give them a handout. They can fill in the blanks, do a bit of exercises. Great for the kinesthetic and visual learners. For the chattier group who like to discuss things, I might facilitate a group discussion. I may do more direct observations or invite them to directly observe me. And for some, I might do more one-on-one -on -one feedback or teaching on a regular basis one-on-one. -on -one. Now, I'm sure a lot of you already do many of these and are already great teachers. This is not about becoming a better teacher, but rather becoming a more intentional teacher. So, for example, a learner that I knew specifically requested to observe me handling difficult conversations. Although I generally invite learners, they wanna come and see me, great, you can join me, not a problem as long as the patient consents. But now that I knew that, I was more intentional in inviting the learner to come with me when I knew I had a difficult case. I'm like, you should come and see this with me, right? Because I know you've asked for this and let's look at it. And they really benefit from that experience. So I hope that I've demonstrated to you that this is a question that is worth asking. And now for myself, at the start of every rotation, I always ask this question to, to the group of learners working with me because it gives me the sense that the teaching style and sharing of information is in alignment with their identity as a learner. So I would encourage you, colleagues, supervisors, even, even senior residents, if you have junior learners with you, especially if you're gonna have a longitudinal relationship with them, to ask this question. But if you're going to ask this question, I have a few tips to share. First is ask the question as it is. It is very intentional in the way that it's put together. You know, asking how do you learn? What kind of learner are you? What works best for you? I mean, these are good questions to ask, but do not fully encapsulate the intention behind the question. Let's dissect it a little bit more. The first part asks what I need to know about you. Right at the start, there's an implicit relational aspect. And I, as a general internist, is different from I as a palliative medicine specialist. And if this learner goes, sees a surgeon who asks this question, the I from the general surgeon is different. Especially if that learner says that they wanna go into general surgery, it suddenly changes the context of the question. The next part is as a learner. Now we're making here a, an emphasis on the role. I'm not asking who you are as a person in general, as a spouse, as a friend, as a family member, et cetera. Really in that role of a learner in this situation. And last is pointing out and making very clear the objective and goal. It's to give you the best educational experience possible. It's specifying the environment and asking, you know, if we can give you the best, right? The absolute best, which is unreachable most of the time but at least something that we can strive for. What would that look like? And asking this question requires a bit of thinking. You know, that's why my second tip is give them a bit of a heads up. As you can see, many learners have answered the question by saying, I don't know. And in fact, when I asked this question, most learners have told me I've never been asked this question. So maybe on the first day of the rotation, Ask them that question and say, tomorrow we'll get back together and tell me what you think about it. 
or send them an email ahead of time to give them time to reflect about this question. The third is ask yourself this question. You know, it's not a super obvious question to answer at the start. But again, we are lifelong learners. We have to do continuing professional education, I have maintenance of credits, learners, learning never stops, right? Warning. So have you asked ourselves, what do I need to know about myself as a learner to give myself the best educational experience possible? So as a virtue of example, I asked myself that question. So what kind of learner am I? I like to take time to assimilate new information. I am not blessed with the sponge brain that many of you have. I do not have that. I need to see things visually. I'm more of that visual learner, a little bit of that kinesthetic learner. If you simply just tell me something, I may forget it. I need to see the writing or, or go and look it up myself or write it down myself. Or if you're gonna tell me something, I need, to, need it to be said to me in sort of a, in a kind of like a storyline and build, uh, build in, a, in a concrete way. I hate reading, <laughs> or especially hate reading without intention. I used to hate at the end of every rotation, preceptors would tell me, yeah, I did a great job, great rotation, yeah, just, just read more. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and then out of guilt, I would go and open my textbook and just, or made a plan. Okay, I'm gonna read chapter one this week, chapter two next week, I never got through them. It's because I needed a clinical question or I needed a question, I needed a context to read, right? And if there was no question, I would create the question. So that's what got me through Royal College studying is I would create questions out of what I'm reading to then go back to it. I like to start with a big picture. I, I have a hard time starting with a minutia. Give me the big picture. What's the big learning lesson? And then we'll start asking why, what, what are the details? How come? How does this make sense? What are the links? I also love to teach. I think that's kind of obvious now. Uh, and I actually use it to test my own knowledge. As a senior resident, I used to sign up for any teaching opportunities because then it would force me to read and read with intention. And it also would challenge me to think ahead, what are learners going to ask me as a question? And am I prepared to answer that question? So now I would try to think ahead. And that was a way to motivate me to build my kind of knowledge. And finally, antibiotics don't make sense to me. I'm just putting that out there. They just don't make sense to me. And I really, I, I feel so bad for infectious disease specialists have to answer a phone call from me. I feel stupid every single time, but I'm gonna still need to work on that one. Uh, but yeah, just, they don't make sense to me. Um, so as you can see, asking that question is very exposing. So my fourth tip is think about whether or not you wanna ask this question in a group setting or one-on-one, -on -one. because there may be benefits to both. Asking it one-on-one, -on -one, obviously, would allow the learner to share with you something they may not have otherwise shared in a group setting, such as the CTU environment scares me. But asking it in a group setting gives another benefit. Now, learners don't often think about this question, as I mentioned. So they feed off of each other. When one hears, oh, that's the way you learn. Oh my God, yeah, me too. Or actually that's not so much how I learn. So it prompts them to reflect a little bit. So maybe doing a hybrid, asking the question as a group and inviting them to find you and talk about it one-on-one -on -one if they have something a bit more private to share. So when you begin to ask the question, what do I need to know about you as a learner to give you the best educational experience possible? You'll begin to know your learners as learners, bringing the concept of personhood into medical education. Learners will be prompted to have a greater self-awareness on their learning styles and environments. The end result is that you will be in a better place to tailor your teaching and approach to care. So how do we teach the learners of the future? Just ask. They'll tell you. Thank you. It went a lot faster than I expected. <laughs> <laughs>
Wonderful. Thank you very much, Mino, for an excellent talk that I think uh, kept us all engaged. And uh, whether we're formally in the learner stage of our careers or whether we're in the staff stage, as you said, we are all learners. And in fact, I would say even as learners, we are all teachers. So very relevant to everybody. Um, I know we have, I'm just going to stop uh, our screen sharing here. I'll just operate your mouse there so you can hear. For some reason, the mouse does not want to activate. I think you the screen share on, it's okay. I'm just thinking to be able to pull up the gallery view if that's possible. But if yeah, oh, here we go. Okay, Dr. Mitri has a new laptop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, let's leave the slide up. Okay. It didn't look like there were any questions uh, pending in the chat. Oh, well, there's there three Q&A, yeah. I don't know why. Where's Adam? <laughs> is he following? <laughs> <laughs> what, why don't you start inviting questions from Miss? audience and I'll see okay. if Adam is nearby to help us get sure. the uh, screen share off. Go ahead. Hey John. Yeah, so the question from Dr. John Neary, um, he asks uh, that in comparison to the patient dignity questions study, where it was done by a nurse uh, uh, sort of asking that question, it was put in the chart, and it wasn't the actual person asking the question who um, is inter sort of intervening directly with the patient. Um, and with the question to, to be asked to learners, it's really us as the supervisor asking that question. There seems to be more of an intentionality with the educational world and not so much of how it was constructed in the study. Is that, that am I capturing yeah. that right? Yeah. Um, so, and how to, how to reconcile that? Um, There's just one at the bottom there. Oh, okay, sounds good. Oh, and it sounds like I was not in presentation mode. You were in presentation mode, the wrong screen got shared. They could still see the slides though. They still see the Okay. Okay. So this is how I learned by asking Rick Hyde. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, so to answer your question, uh, Dr. Neary, so um, I actually think the, the intentionality is actually present in both. Because at the end of the day, with the patient dignity question, though they were not themselves asking that question, they were recipient of the answers and the knowledge of the answer may change the way that they approach the patient. Now, it didn't actually evaluate how their approach to patients may have deferred. It was more of a survey in that moment, but nonetheless, they have been um, given more knowledge about the patient. So I do think that it's, it was still applicable in that context as well. And I think both with, with patients and with learners, as the person asking that question, I think the, 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 the aspect of intentionality is definitely applicable in both settings. Um, so there's a question, should we go for the, the chat? One person asks, uh, so Graham Jones asks, how can teachers negatively impact learners? Oh, how can teachers negatively impact learners? That's a, that's a big question. <laughs> I mean, there's so many ways that teachers can negatively impact learners. Um, 
I don't know if there's any specific context to that question or any sort of uh, way to, <laughs> to narrow it down because I mean, I mean, they can hit learners. I mean, that's very <laughs> negative. Um, but I maybe if I can interpret it a little bit more, is it maybe are you asking how could this question potentially negatively impact learners? Is, is, is that a, a fair interpretation? I don't know if there's going to be any comments put in there. Um, I mean, I, I, I think in asking this question to learners, a potential negative impact may be in if it was not asked appropriately or in the right context or environment. Like any communication tool we use with patients, even though the tool is a great tool, used in the wrong time, in the wrong place can be devastating, right? Um, you know, asking the patient dignity question to a patient who is crashing in front of you is not really the right time to ask that question. So it's um, being conscientious of the environment right now um, is really important. You know, if you ask that question in a, in a, in a, in a, to a learner and the learner is starting to open up and being vulnerable um, in front of you and asking more probing questions in front of a whole group can potentially be very negative and damaging for that learner. Um, so it's, it's, I think it's more of just being aware of the context and asking that question. Um, should we go back and forth? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anybody have a question or comment in the audience? I, I have a question. Yeah. So um, do you think there's any downside now that everybody here in this room and, and on our Zoom screen has this kind of question in their mind, do you think there's any diminishing returns if learners are being asked this exact question in the exact same phrased way in every setting that they're in? Do you think that they end mm -hmm. up coming up with some sort of canned answer or is there any, is mm -hmm. there, does the, does, do the returns diminish in any way by um, repeated use? Yeah, that's, that's actually a great question. I think uh, they would have heard your question uh, yeah. online. Um, that's a great question. Um, I mean, potentially yes and no. I mean, if we think about over our evaluations and, and, and we always ask learners at the beginning of every rotation, you know, what do you want to learn? What are you hoping to get out of this rotation? And some will have very canned answers, um, but some will have more intentionality in their answers because they're like, no, I'm in a new rotation. This is really what I want to get out of it. So at the end of the day, I think it falls a little bit more of a responsibility on the learners to be a little bit more intentional in their answers. And I mean, the nature of the question, like I said, it changes when, who, depending who's asking it. So I need to know about you. So I, who's the I, right? And if the learner is very conscientious, you know, I, I can speak from my experience. I, when I was in general surgery and I in internal medicine was two different uh, like people who I was actually the you as a learner for, for me in that context, super uncomfortable in general surgery uh, and much more comfortable in a CTU environment. Um, and so expressing that can make a difference. Um, but for sure, there's a risk that uh, it might get canned. But I think I think more benefit than not because it's forcing the learners to really reflect every single time. Um, who am I as a learner, and who am I here and now? Right. Um, another question from the uh, from online uh, is from Dr. Tony Kerrigan. Can the ability to be self-aware be assessed in the selection of medical students in whom there is often an unhealthy level of perfectionism? Uh, so that's a very good question. Um, and in fact, we, I think there is a way to ask that. Um, there's a way to um, assess by asking questions about how self-aware they are as an individual in general. I think people who have higher, higher levels of self-awareness in general become more self-aware of who they are in different environments and different settings. Right. Um, so asking questions like, you know, um, what was your, you know, what, what is the time when you failed and what's your response to failure, right? It's forcing them to reflect a little bit. And that's, uh, you know, like I said, failure is one that actually really highlights, are they capable of self-reflecting? We've all failed to some degree, something at some point in our lives. Do we recognize it and how do we respond to it? Uh, those who choose to ignore it or not do much about it really lack that self-awareness skills, but those who are forced into think, okay, who am I? What am I doing with this? Where am I going with this? Um, 
is I think a great way to start asking learners. And it also goes away, pulls away from that often, if you, as you've mentioned, that often unhealthy level of perfectionism to just acknowledge that we're not perfect and it's okay. Um, another question comes from Dr. Alan Taniguchi. Thanks, Mino. How often do you actually change your teaching style based on the learner dignity question? Oh, I never thought about calling it that. Um, how do you handle working with a group of learners who might simultaneously need different techniques uh, or accommodations? So the first part of the question, how do you often actually change your teaching style? So um, it's not that I'll completely dramatically change my teaching style. I will tweak it is what ends up happening. So I, I show the sort of the six different ways that I'll generally do teaching in a clinical setting, but I will sort of tune up and tune down each in different ones, depending on who the learners are, what they've expressed in terms of ways that they learn. Um, so it's not that it dramatically changes, it's just done with greater intention. Um, it has also forced me, though, to think of more creative ways to teach, particularly if there are sort of like, I've never heard this one. This is different of your learning style, like the one who asked for homework. I had to think about, okay, now I need to start giving you assignments, <laughs> right, uh, which I don't generally do. Um, so sometimes I've been surprised by the responses, and that that will prompt me to, to change. For, for maybe new teachers who don't have a whole bank of teaching style, this could also be a way to prompt them to start developing their teaching style and thinking more, um, a, uh, a greater selection. You know, this is great to start uh, honing as a skill as senior residents as they start to test out different teaching styles and moving from the learner to the, to the teacher role. Uh, the next question was, how do you, uh, from uh, Dr. Taniguchi, how do you handle working with a group of learners who might simultaneously need different teaching techniques or combination? Yeah, so, I mean, I can't, I can't clone myself. Uh, so I, I just have to manage in doing different teaching styles with different group of learners. I try to find some sort of alignment. And I mean, a lot of teaching styles usually incorporate many different ways of assimilating information. You know, when you give a handout and they have to fill in the the, the different blank uh, statements. That is great for the visual learners. That's great for the kinesthetic learners. When you're talking to them, you know, they're, they're trying to match it to what they're, they're doing. There's a bit of that auditory that takes place there. So there's some teaching styles that can suit many different learning styles, but sometimes I just can't succeed. So then I just have to switch it up uh, uh, from a day to day. Uh, and know that on that day, I'm meeting more one learner's need, not so much the other, and the next day switch it around and hopefully meet another learner's needs. Right? Um, any questions in the audience? Yes. Um, I actually answered the question this week, so how you care? So the learners saying that they had to answer this question in palliative care this week. <laughs> yes. I was going to ask this question. Yeah. I answered it like through an email, and I sent like, an email to the form. Yes. Do you think the answer would be different if they were asked in person? So the question is, yeah, I received this question in an email and I answered by email. Do you think the answers would be different if uh, it was sent to, if it was asked in person? Um, yes, I'm going to say yes. And I can say that uh, just an email with no follow through is not sufficient in my personal experience because the interpretation of the question may be misinterpreted essentially like it may be um misunderstood um I, i've had some learners being very reflective and ask and and give out more thorough answers and i've had ones just give me sort of the one brief answer like oh you know epas whatever it's like <laughs> okay epas is not the answer to this question <laughs> at all <laughs> So I, I think there's certainly a benefit in asking it in person, talking about it a little bit more, probing a little bit more. What do you mean? Can you tell me a little bit more? Explore that a little bit more. So yes. Uh, I hope it was a positive experience nonetheless in trying to answer the question. <laughs> we got another question. Okay, yes. Yeah. So like let's say you have the feeling that you have to approach them in person. Is there, is there any ability to ask, hey, you know, versus change in terms of like how it gets done? The question is, is there any benefit in asking the question again 
sometime throughout, I'm assuming throughout the same rotation with the same preceptors, right? Um, I mean, probably in the, I, I've never done that myself in re-asking the question and prompting again. I think the biggest challenge to be honest is time. It's just trying to carve out the time to do everything that we need to do as teachers to provide the best experience and to go back and sit down and let's talk about that, right? I'll spend more time giving you about feedback, sort of going into halfway through the rotation. We're gonna talk more about feedback and how can we do better instead of re-asking that question again. I mean, the ideal is sure, ask it again. Say, are we in target? Is this truly who you are as a learner? And prompt them again. Um, certainly something that maybe coaches can ask in the constantly based medical education, although they are not the ones who are direct, directly supervising them, but prompting them to say, you know, you're in this rotation now. Did you think about what kind of learner you are in that rotation? Maybe think about that, share that with your preceptors if there's something that's different. Right, um, that could be another way to sort of prompt them again to think about it. Um, uh, Dr. Mitchell Levine asks, if you cannot accommodate to each learner's needs as per their answer, does that in fact hurt the relationship? Potentially, um, you know, you are responsible in some way of the knowledge you've gained, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning. If they're giving you an answer, um, and you can't meet that need, I think you, one has to be quite explicit about it. You know, let's say they say, I learn best, I don't know, when I'm in space, <laughs> like some <laughs> really crazy thing. I don't know, I, I can't think of a concrete example that's so unachievable. Um, but, you know, one has to be then say, you know, I, I, that's a really challenging one. I'll do my best and try, but I don't know if I can actually meet your need. But the fact that you you show effort and try, I think, is already says a lot to the learner in that you are um, seeing them as a learner and trying to reach out to them. Uh, just like with patients, you know, it's just recognizing our patients' needs goes a long way and saying to them, I know you need this. I don't, I can't meet that need personally. I can't fulfill that need, but I see you need this. Let's see what we can do about that. That already is, I think, a huge, uh, a huge um, benefit. Uh, yes. So the question is: Have I ever asked this question where uh, learners have? shared how they, how that, uh, being asked that question impacted them versus other rotations where they were not asked that question. So, I mean, I didn't do any formal study to do that, but I sort of heard through the grapevine from some learners uh, of one learner telling me that other learners have told her, and then she said, by the way, you should know. Um, she told me that they were surprised about being asked that question and they were further surprised that it actually made a difference and mattered. That they saw that what happened afterwards in the weeks that followed in being under my supervision, that I actually, you know, would point it out. You said this to me too, like a week ago, so we're gonna go and do this now, right? And so it, it positively surprised them and had a positive impact. Um, how does it compare to other rotations? I don't know, I can't say, and I can't comment about that, but it seems like it did have a positive impact. Uh, one question here. Uh, do you really believe that learners are no longer willing, receptive to getting negative feedback? In this postmodern world, truth is becoming more relative and a teacher's knowledge and expertise is only considered an opinion. If they are wrong or made a glaring mistake, many cannot handle this and is considered in quote opinion. What are your views on this? So receptiveness to negative feedback. I mean, it's a little bit outside of the purpose of this question, but I think that there is difficulty, as I said, Failure in medicine is very difficult at all levels. Even saying, you know, you meet expectations is, can be perceived as a failure. 
but you met expectations, <laughs> you know? But it's not a five. It's not, you know, exceeds expectation. Um, I, I, th this is, a, it's a difficult question because it's talking about the culture that's created in medicine and we, this, this, this greater culture. I, I, I kind of equated it a little bit about this fear of telling patients to say the D word or talk about end of life and accepting the trajectory and limited prognostications, right? Um, and it's our responsibility to disclose that information. And I think it's equally our responsibility to highlight to learners if we think they're headed on a path of greater challenges. I mean, the, the consequences of, of, of failing or, or perceived failing at a, at a junior learner level is that you may have to repeat the rotation. At a staff level is, that's a college complaint, right? The degree of difference is huge and it's our responsibility as teachers and supervisors to make sure that our learners are not headed towards a college complaint. Um, and it's hard to think about it in that moment, uh, but I think it is our responsibility as long as the, the quote negative feedback is more of a constructive feedback that is given with context and, and rationale. And uh, I think then that could be better received. But at the end of the day, you know, part of that self-awareness skills, you know, I, I, I've had learners cry and it's okay to cry. It's okay to not feel well for receiving a bad evaluation. Just accept the emotion. But the question is not about whether it was good or bad to have that emotion. It's what do you do afterwards with that, right? So it's, I think as preceptors, we have to prepare that there's gonna be all sorts of emotional reactions afterwards. It's okay to have those emotions. You're allowed to have those emotions for all sorts of different reasons. Um, it's more of thinking then, what do we do after that? What, is, what will the learner do after that? Uh, there's another question here. Uh, uh, Jamie Shell asks, how can we encourage self-awareness for learners who answer, I don't know? So that was part of uh, what I did with the four cardinal skills. Uh, of just trying to promote greater self-awareness um, in, I mean, in that, I'm gonna interpret it as asking if they're in the moment saying, I don't know. And what do we do in that moment to prompt them to think about it a little bit more? Um, I would then start asking prompting questions. Well, like, okay, well, how, how do you best learn, right? Let's just start to deconstruct this a little bit more. So how do you best learn? How is that different compared to your previous rotation? Did you send something different there and there? When you go and have to study for an exam, how do you study for an exam? What resources do you look at? Do you actually like to read or do you find lectures work better for you? So I'll just start like prompting with a lot of questions for learners who are really having trouble to answer that question. And then I would really encourage them, like just start thinking about that as you go from rotation to rotation, what really helps you to learn best um, would be my, my advice. Uh, last question here, do we introduce learners to this concept as part of their orientation? How would you do this? Oh, that's an interesting question. Uh, if it's the orientation to the rotation, I would say yes. If it's the, uh, you know, welcome to this rotation, here are things you need to know. And then a part of orientation, I think, should be let's review your goals and objectives for this rotation. And as part of that, from parcel, I would ask, okay, how do you, uh, what do we need to know about you as a learner to give you the best educational experience possible, which will be our gateway to try to meet those learners' goals and objectives. Um, I wouldn't do it as part of welcome to internal medicine three years, mm -hmm. right? What do we need to know about you as a learner? It's too large of a context. You need a bit more of a narrow context, I think, to better answer this question, um, in my opinion. Okay. Any others there? No, nope, that, that was the last one. Any other questions from our um, audience here in person? I, I have one last question okay. that's taking us a little bit away from this topic. So I wanted to make sure that um, everything else has been addressed. I was wondering if you could uh, give us a little spiel about the palliative medicine program uh, oh. and tell us what, what a little bit of the structure, who's eligible to apply and what the timelines are uh, for anybody who may be interested. Oh, so the, the subspecialty mm -hmm. fellowship. Yeah, uh, sure. I mean, this is a, uh, a new program that starting at McMaster University, the, the subspecialty um, in palliative medicine uh, started, launched in 2017, uh, going from a one-year to a two-year subspecialty. And the reason for it is to uh, address the increasing complexity of patients uh, who are dealing with chronic diseases. 
And palliative medicine is not really a focus on end of life, but really on quality of life for patients throughout their entire disease trajectory. And so uh, um, to address that, they created the, 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 the two-year program. Uh, and I mean, there are many, many reasons that they created the two-year program as well. Um, um, and so for those who are interested in applying to the program, the, the sort of direct route of entry is those who are doing an anesthesia, internal medicine, or neurology core uh, residency. Um, otherwise, other residents from other programs are eligible to apply as well if they meet certain criteria, uh, which is to do uh, sufficient medicine rotations as a senior, uh, as a, in a senior role. Um, but if you have any questions about that, don't hesitate to reach me. There's my contact. Oh, it's not, no. We, we took it down. We took it down. <laughs> my contact information is there, but you can find me. <laughs> I'm Googleable. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Sorry, so we went, went one minute over, uh, but thanks again so much for a fabulous presentation and a great discussion. And we'll see everybody, St. Joe's, back here next week. Um, Respirology, we're going to have an introduction to the new sarcoidosis program that's starting up at the Firestone. Thanks so much. How did you get the mouse to work? <laughs>